All right. Hi, everyone. Welcome to, to week one of Stage Door Medium. I can't believe this is happening. I'm, I'm so excited. And I could pinch myself. We have the incomparable, incomparable Jenny Denoya here from, uh, from Mamma Mia, from Wicked. Hi, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm so excited to be here with you. I'm doing well. I'm so excited. The minute, the minute we, <laughs> we, we met a couple of weeks ago, I was like, this is, this is going to be a good one. I knew it. So um, if you were watching at home, so I've, I've got to like brag about her for a second. Jenny is like a true, true triple threat performer. Um, I saw her back at, in Wicked in 2013 um, in Rochester. And then I will definitely... <laughs> I'm going to pop up that picture on the screen where you're like, yes, so oh my God, <laughs> you're probably bundled <laughs> up because it was so cold in Buffalo and Rochester. Like you I, looked I look, I look so just tired and weathered in that picture, you were, but it is a fun memory. <laughs> you looked very toasty and just comfortable. You no. Know? Um, so Jenny holds the record. Correct me if I'm wrong. You hold the record for having played it in the, the, the most amount of performances around the world. Correct. Yeah, I don't even know if that's correct, but I know that I, I, I guess, hold the record for playing it in the most companies and in the most countries. Yep. Yeah. So I don't know performance number wise, but yes. Yeah. yeah, because so I have it written down. Correct me if I'm wrong. I had Broadway. Well, it started off in Chicago. And then mm -hmm. at the one point, eventually it was Broadway, London, both U.S. tours, Korea and Australia. Correct. Correct. Yes. No homework. And then uh, <laughs> for that, you're on the national tour of first national tour of Mamma Mia. Could you take us back? I guess, tell me a couple things, if you don't mind, what got you into to theater? Like how early did you have the bug? And then how did Mamma Mia come about? And then how did Wicked come about for you? You know, I grew up, I kind of grew up wanting, uh, already like not understanding, but wanting to be like a performer, I guess. I would put on shows in my living room and, you know, around three years old, my mom put me into dance because I was a wild child, I guess, and I needed some structure. So, you know, it's like kids go into like dance or karate or gymnastics, that kind of thing. And dance was the thing that, that I went into and it ended up like really, really vibing with me. I, I thrived in, in that arena. Um, but I guess mo more importantly, when I was really young, my, my uncle was a performer and his partner, who is still a performer in the business. So I grew up going to see them in shows and just like being in awe of what they were doing. And I, I kind of never wanted to do anything else. So, you know, fast forward past, you know, lots of dance stuff and competitions and I did a lot of community theater and high school, the high school musicals. Um, and so I decided to go to college as a dance major. And um, cause that's kind of where I was comfortable. I hadn't really started like vocally training at all um, and just singing like in choirs. So I was in school, I was in college for dance and um, I did my first freshman year. And then that summer, I went to New York City and I did a uh, dance internship at Broadway Dance Center, which is like a, you know, one of the main dance studios here in, in the city. And I just, I, I took like three to four dance classes a day. I was there all day long and I was just living my best life. I loved it so, so much. And so I got back to college feeling like I was ready to like take this next step and use everything I'd learned during the summer. And I get to back to my sophomore year of college and September 11th happens. So I've been aged now that you can, you know, count the years from there. But um, that was like a really huge turning point for me. And um, I decided to, well, after I had my few weeks of sitting inside, scared to go outside, watching just the news, kind of similar to times that we're in right now, mm -hmm. I decided to kind of pick myself back up and I moved to New York. So I moved to New York on December 31st of 2001. And I went to Times Square for time, for New Year's Eve, which was so wild and weird after, you know, New York going through this uh, just incredible, crazy time. Like, um, but it was very like uplifting. It was very like New York strong, that whole 
um, feeling. And it was, it was amazing. So I started, I got a job as a waitress and I would work the breakfast shift at Cafe Europa on the corner of Broadway, where the old Broadway dance center used to be. Mm -hmm. And then I would walk over to Broadway dance center and take, you know, two dance classes. And, um, during that time, it was like about a month and a half in, and I went to an open call for Mamma Mia. And I did the whole, I was non-equity, so I had to wait till the end. And I was like five, six hundredth in line. And I just started, I was very lucky and I just kind of continued to get called back. And I don't, I can't even, I can't recollect any part of this time. I just remember sitting outside of a studio and watching other people do the dance combinations. Don't even remember really how it got there until I was booking the job and the company manager was calling me saying, you're going to make, I can't remember what the equity minimum was then, but you're going to make, you know, $1,204. And I was like a month, but that was a week. week. You know what I mean? <laughs> and that was like, I was 19 years old and I was the only underage you know, child in the company. And that was something that the company manager always would poke fun at me for in a, in a very, you know, loving way. But, they, but it's funny though, know. because they're all supposed <laughs> to be like 19 and 18. You know what I mean? Yeah. And, I mean, at least, at least Sophie's friends are supposed to be. Yeah. So I actually was, it was very, it was a very wild time, but I, I really treated that time as, you know, let's learn from the best because I was in a company with incredible performers of all ages, people that had done, you know, you know, loads of Broadway shows like Dee Hody, like who, who you could just like look up to. <laughs> She's perfect. Um, and then other, you know, people that were around my age, not as not, you know, 19, but 20, 21, 22. And they were all just, you know, maybe on their second big credit. Um, and it was just, it was a really cool time. So I guess moving on, can you tell me how did Wicked come about for you? Well, I was in We Will Rock You. Like I said, I did that show in Vegas and, um, a friend of mine in the show who, uh, actually became, she was a future alphaba, Marcy Dodd. Oh, um, shout out Marcy. I love you. <laughs> but great. we were, oh yeah, she's incredible. She opened the second national tour, um, as Alphaba, but we actually drove from Vegas to LA to go to a, a Wicked audition. Um, and she she was going into the singer call. I went into the dancer call. And, um, you know, I went through a couple different um, dance, you know, uh, we did the Ostas ballroom combination and we did, um, I don't think they do it anymore, but we did like a monkey combination. And, um, and they, I think they actually stopped doing that one, but, um, and then I sang 16 bars of music, uh, actually how will I know by Whitney Houston. And then I kind of left and that was that. Um, and I was still doing, we will rock you. And we got, we will rock. You got their closing notice, like a two month notice, which was kind of awesome. And I just reached out to casting and I just was like, listen, I, Casting for Wicked, excuse me. And um, I pretty much just said, I want to be in Wicked. Um, I went to this audition. I got called, I got kept till the end. And please just put my name in the hat for anything that opens up. I just want to be in the show. So, I mean, it didn't happen immediately, but maybe about a month after We Will Rock You closed, I got a call to go to, that I was going to be in the Chicago company of Wicked as the, as a dancer swing. That's still a pretty good turnaround though. I mean, yes, I have been so fortunate and I, yeah, I've been very fortunate that I have up until like the end of my uh, standby on Broadway Wicked, I had been employed since I was 19 years old. So I was about 26 yeah. Holy cow. Can I it's ask, so nuts. Let's my other question for you, because I, I do have an audio clip that I'm going to share with the audience. I promise you it's, 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 I trust me. It, it's, okay. a, it's a good one. How does somebody who just sing a couple bars, but is primarily goes in as a dancer. How do you belt this out every night? Get ready at home. It will snatch every wig you have off your head. Oh gosh. 
Wait for it. How? How? You're you're like, well, I'm a dancer. Like very, very showgirl. So we're like, no me alone. I'm a dancer. How do you go from <laughs> Vegas? We had to make that connection. How do you how do you go from dancing to like where did where did somebody discover like, oh, your voice is like crazy good? How did how did the alphabet track eventually come about for you? Well, um, gosh, the thing I, I always hear of clips of like if I hear a clip of me singing, I'm always like immediately red and like oh I'm so sorry to be it's no so no red. it's you're very sweet and I'm so like it's just I'm I blush like it gets overwhelming sometimes <laughs> but um I, I listen to that clip and I'm like did that sound okay <laughs> you know you start <laughs> yeah. you start picking it apart um I so I always grew up singing but the the way that the alphabet cover came about was I was in the Chicago company and um, our, our alphabet understudy in the ensemble hurt their back and they were going to be out for, I think it was like two or three months. And this was back when, you know, not a million people had done wicked where they could just like fly, like one of these 10 people out to, you know, go into this track in the show and they wanted to cover it internally. So the, uh, the musical director helped me record a couple of the songs on a cassette tape yeah. <laughs> uh, that, we, <laughs> that we sent to, um, you know, the MD in New York. And uh, they just said, sure, you know, she can be an, an, you know, an emergency cover, which I was an emergency cover for a long time. Um, and then I, I ended up going on, which was, I don't even remember it. <laughs> I so out of, so out of body is what I would imagine. Oh my God. Yes. I don't, I mean, I barely remember the first like five years of shows. Like um, they were all trial and error, honestly. I would imagine the amount of focus and just blinders that you have to put on to get through that show is, is probably incredible. Yeah, you can't, you really can't crack or fool around or at least most people can't, you know, sure. everybody's very different and I can't, I'm one of those people I have to stay on track because yeah. <laughs> you'll lose it, you'll lose it. That's how I am with a reading. I find that sometimes a client will want to make a joke or like talk about something for a second. And I never want to come off as rude, but I'm, if I'm like, okay, let's, let's get back to the work. It's not that I don't want to talk with them. I'm like, we can talk about that after your brain goes to a very funny place. If you don't stay on course as a medium, because all of a sudden you're now, I, I always say you've got one foot here and the other foot on the other side when you're trying to read. And I feel like if you start to have too much of like a fun conversation with somebody, your brain and your body roots back into this side when it should be over here. So, yeah, no, that makes complete sense. Why that would be like throw, why that would throw you off specifically because yeah. you're working with two different and I'm like, uh, worlds essentially. <laughs> exactly. Uh, <laughs> So can you talk about, I would love to, um, one of the parallels that I was hoping to discuss this week is I find it fascinating that as an audience member, I think there, you know, you don't really consider the fact that it is a job, you know, it, it's a career. It's, you know, you going into do a show is going, like our equivalent of going into the office. And I would love to talk with you about having played Alphaba on and off for about 14 years. I remember we had spoken about what I'm, I'm assuming there's got to be a temptation for the part to feel stale or old at times. Well, I mean, it definitely is difficult, right? Because you are doing the same, you're saying the same lines, you're wearing all the same costumes. Um, and there, there are moments that, you know, that I've caught myself at least during a scene being like, okay, I have to get eggs, paper towels. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, almost like you're <laughs> citing a grocery, grocery list, but I mean, there's so little time for Alphabet to actually do that because there's never a moment of rest in the show. Um, and like we were talking about earlier, like the only way that you can get through an, a show as Alphabet is remaining present. You have to remain present because if you miss a cue, if you miss this, I mean, it's a matter of like the, like something like really just going downhill from there, whether the scene or the the show is ruined. Right. Um, so that's, that's a pressure that I feel like all alphabas kind of carry with them is that they're, they're 
you know, one of the women carrying the show and it's, it's a large weight and people come to see these iconic moments. Like that's why they come to see Wicked. Um, so for me personally, that is always in the back of my mind. Um, but also, you know, like I had said before, you know, the first, you know, handful of years I did the show, I was an understudy and then a standby and always, always, you know, wishing that I could play the role during this time. But now I really, I look back at it with so much gratitude that I wasn't because, it was trial and error. All of those years where I was, I was really learning, learning these moments and what they, what they meant to me. Um, and also learning the pace of the show, which is the whole other half of how to play alphabet eight times a week. You know, there's a lot of incredibly talented, um, humans out there that could, that could bust out like one of the best performances as, as Elphaba if they went on for one night, right? But playing her eight times a week is a completely different ball game. Not just because of the pace of the show, but because it's mentally draining and it takes it takes pieces of you away while you're while you're doing this, you know? It's so weird that you're not to cut. That's literally how I describe mediumship sometimes. If you're not wow. careful about putting yourself back together and closing down, so to speak, after a reading, you lose little bits and pieces of yourself. Like that, mm-hmm. keep going. I'm sorry. This, this, it's so no, neat. no, it's, it's so true because, you know, and like a lot of performers, not just playing alpha, but, you know, you you put pieces of yourself on stage every night. And for me, I really have leaned into using parts of my personal life to either get through moments or to channel certain moments or to to really find a way to personally connect. So you're leaving these bits and pieces on stage every single night, eight times a week. And then you're just doing it over and over and over again. But, um, yeah, I don't know. Like it's a, it is a trial and error thing. I've gone through, you know, six months to a year of like it really, really working for me and me just like smoothly sailing through. And then I've also gone through some dips where it's too much and it's, it's good to like step away from the show. So like when people say like, wow, you've been doing this for 14 years. And I, yes, I have been. And I love, I, I truly love and I'm grateful for every moment of it. But the the breaks that I've had between contracts have been needed and necessary because like you said, you kind of have to know how to pull yourself back together. That's why, you know, a lot of alphabets don't really stay past nine months to a year because you you truly need to like, you know, recharge your batteries because- nobody is, is superhuman, you know, I mean, you're already pretty superhuman to play Alphaba, but nobody can, can do it for so yeah. long. And I mean, I, I give you credit. I mean, I, I there are, I mean, there's definitely a cap for the amount of readings that I will take a week because if it's so draining and I, I feel like I would not to take a liberty, but I'm assuming when you're playing such a high profile demanding part, like Alphaba, you really have to live like a nun and I mean, I'm mm-hmm. assuming until that show is in your, until it's in your bloodstream and same for being a medium, it doesn't matter how many years I've been doing this. If I know that I have a reading, like when, when I read you, if I knew that it was at 11 AM, I was up by like seven 30 prepping for you. And then I was in bed by like 10 at night, the, you know, 10 PM the night before, because that's my job. If I say yes to it, if, if I say, yes, I'm going to do this you can be damn sure that I'm going to do the best job possible that I can do. So for mm-hmm. me, if that means that I have to get X amount of hours of sleep and then I have to meditate and really, I mean, that's why I love doing readings in the morning too, is that there's less stuff on your plate to trip you up and get on your nerves for the day. You know what I mean? So I, I try to do it as early as I can in the morning. That way my brain is fresh. What do you determine to be like to make for a bad show for you? And then how do you eventually go, nope, I'm, I'm putting the blinders on. Like you talked about, I'm just going right ahead with the show. 
Yeah. Well, I mean, I definitely think it, there's a learning curve to that. Like a, I get this question a lot and I think it kind of sits in that same pocket of questions of like, how do you deal with your nerves? How do you, you know, it, it, I've had shows where I have sang a bad wizard and I, and my whole entire show has just unraveled to the ground. Um, so I claim no way of like having had this, like, <laughs> like known, like knowing how to do this from the beginning, you know, it's taken years for me to understand that singing a bad note in Wizard and I does not determine, you know, my whole entire show. It also doesn't determine whether I'm a good performer or not, you know, we're human and we make mistakes and that's fine. And I mean, what's the first thing that you, you learn as a child or something I always try and teach my daughter. It's like, you know, when you fall back, when you fall down, you get back up, you know, you have to learn how to brush it off. Because if you let something like that literally take you down, like you, you will fall completely flat on your face. So, and, and, you know, in the last, especially in the last like four or five years, you know, I feel like I'm, I'm, I'm in my mid to late thirties and I'm, you know, that stuff is, it's noise at this point, right? Like I did a lot of time in my, in the rest of my life, just being even like in middle school and high school, focusing on these very small, like really insignificant things that, you know, worrying about what other people think about me. I think I listened to this podcast the other day and I can't remember who was talking. Oh, it was Allie Raceman. She's an Olympic, um, an Olympic, Olympic uh, gymnast and she was on uh what's it called armchair expert that's like one of my favorite podcasts to listen to and she was just talking about how like she's people pleaser and how like she would just kind of like conform to what other people wanted just so that just to make them happy but she like lost herself in that in that way and I have dealt with life in that way from the beginning especially as a performer we we all want to please like the director, the choreographer, whoever we're we're working with and for the audience, you know, so you think about, oh, I need to sing this crazy set of notes. I need to do this. And then when you can't do it or when you fail at doing it, you just like crumble. But I mean, like, like I said, like there's bigger problems in this world right now. And the fact that I get to step on stage and like live my, live in my dreams and sing all this beautiful music and be in this incredible show and you know uh play this role that so many people can can connect with on on many different levels is a gift so i just try and remind myself every day i i I always say to myself there there has to be somebody in this audience who's never seen this show before i always say that to myself And the second is, as I say that, that I, I am like, I am me, like I bring myself to the table and that's good enough. (laughs) You know what I mean? Um, And I just stay true and stay present. So it's, you know, it's these reminders that you kind of have to trick yourself into not trick yourself, but always remind yourself so that you're, you're like, you're not carrying the weight of the world on your shoulders every moment of the show. I know. I, I mean, don't know. That I, was a really long-winded answer. No, it was the most beautiful <laughs> answer. And there's so many parallels, I think, with with when I go into a reading. And I also have to vouch, I, my husband, sometimes I will I will beat myself up after a reading. So if I will have somebody, he's nodding right now, like, oh my God. So if I have, like, if, I bring, <laughs> if I bring four out of the five really heavy hitters for somebody through during a reading, and at the end, I'm like, was was there somebody else that you wanted to talk to? And they're like, yeah, I was really hoping for this person as well. If I got four out of five, but not that fifth, I will, I'll beat myself up. And I'm like, what did I do wrong? What wasn't, what, I must not have prepared enough. And I'm like, no, I, I, I did the work as best as I could today. Um, you know, we're, we're human. There are so many little factors that, that could set us off. And, and it's funny when I vent to him about things, he'll so succinctly, sum up what I will be going over my head and for in hours. And, and just recently I did a reading with somebody and they, I thought it, I thought it went great, but this was their reaction the entire time. Mm-hmm. Yeah. 
I guess. And like, oh. it was, it was really like, could you imagine like you're hitting these high apps during Wicked and you have somebody that's like, uh-huh. And so it, it bugs me. And I, the reason where I'm going with this story is he brought up such a great point that I feel like there's so many parallels for both of us. He was like, you can't equate the quality of your work based on the response of the recipient. And it snapped me out of my like pissy mood so quick. And I'm like, you're so right. You know, and I feel like the same, I remember, um, I forgot who it was. I don't know if it was Diane Paulus. Um, it was her, it was Diane Paulus was doing, I think a Ted talk and she was talking about how she teach. She always reminds her cast, we can't base our worth off of the way an audience received that message or that story tonight. And they might've been, they might go home and say that was the best alphabet I've ever seen when here you are beating yourself up about your performance, but you know, it, sometimes they might not show it on their face or, and I think that's something that we as artists and mediums both have to get comfortable with. It's like, we might not see the recipient of, of our work at the end, you know, like I might not see they cried in the car on the way home because everything hit home or they were like, they, they text their mom and they're like, I need you to get back and see Wicked again with Jenny Denoy because she was the best. You know, like we don't see that sometimes, but I think we just have to trust in the quality of the work that we're doing um, and, and know that I always say, if you're coming from a good place and as long as you're prepared and you've prepped yourself like that, that's all we can do. So Jenny, um, I read yes. Jenny a couple weeks ago. You had never been read before. And uh, never. I was no. wondering, do you feel comfortable? Is there anything you can share from our time together, obviously, that you feel comfortable about? Or how was the experience? Yeah. So yes, I've never been read before, but I'm oh I've always been very open to it and wanting to be read. Um, and I was a little like, I think like most people are a little like is this real? Like, I don't know. Like, I, I also, like, I don't have a lot of, you know, thankfully I don't have a lot of close people to me that have passed away. So I don't really have that like need to connect, you know? Um, but obviously there are people that I, I have thought of that I wanted to connect with, but I think with you specifically, uh, we were connected through a, a mutual good friend of ours and I trust him like with my life. So I trusted that you were genuine. And from the moment that we spoke to like, even just the messaging back and forth, I was like, oh, wow. Like all the hairs kind of like sat up on the back of my neck, especially when we first messaged and you had had yeah. some people that were already kind of coming forward. And there was so much that was so undeniably true and um I, there were things that just nobody would ever know so you know our reading was essentially it, it was for me it it gave me a major sense of relief right because I feel like in your life you um you know you ask yourself those questions am I doing this right I don't know what to do or I'm going through this thing or, you know, pandemic or, you know, whatever it is that's sure. happening. And I, I really walked away with a sense of relief and it was, I, I feel like it, it very much shifted the way that my mind was working um, or thinking about things. And, and then obviously like the personal connections that you had made, um, I marinated with them too, like over the next like three or four days. And I was like, Oh, I can see that. And I can see that like, right. Like that's good, which I loved so much because, um, and, and I also had me asking myself some other questions too, like, Oh, okay. I could, I should probably maybe do this a little differently or, you know, I'm, I don't know. It was, it was positive. It was all very positive. And obviously I, I won't go into detail, but I loved when I, when I read your grandparents, when I pulled them through and even the wording on things that your grandfather told me to word things a particular way, we don't know as a, as a medium, why we're being told to say something a particular way. We're just say, we're just sometimes like, and I remember he said, say this verbatim. And so I did. And, you know, it's when we kind of have to get out of our own way and just trust our instincts and say, okay, I'm going to word it this way. And Sure enough, I remember when I said it, it hit home with you immediately. Um, you know, there were some really cool things and 
they're doing well. You know, you're, yeah, we had, we had definite moments where I was like, especially within our, our messaging back and forth too, like where I went back and reread it like multiple times because I was like, this is real. Like, wow. Like these people out there somewhere get it or they see me, they, they're supporting me. Um, there was, like I said, such a sense of just like positive relief. But um, also I I do want to mention what what I really loved about the way that you, you do your thing is um, the kind of like the opening. I don't know if you'd call it a meditation or a prayer or just kind of like a thankful, like a thanking of like, here we are. Thank you for opening up. And then the like kind of the close down, which is very similar again to like what I would do to prepare for a performance. Sorry, my dog might bark again. Okay. <laughs> um, but that's what I do at the beginning of a performance. I, I'll kind of like say like a thank you for letting me be here. You know, all of the things that I have to remember before I run on stage, but also just like a, please keep us safe, you know? Yeah. that kind of thing. And then you warm down after a show. So it's like, yeah, and it's I, and I close similar. down because it's always starting from a place of gratitude and ending from a place of gratitude. You kind of set the rules of the, for you, for your show, for me, for the, for the reading, you know, I'm only going to allow people in that would have known you that are good, nice people. Um, and it's funny. I always, I do this little thing right before I meet with a client where I make a list of what I'm grateful for. And I make a list of what I'm stressed out about. So that way I can say I've left it here and I'm not bringing my own crap with me into the reading. Um, I'm leaving this aspect here. But then I also write, why do I do what I, what I do? Because I think like there's a real tendency for, if not careful, to mediumship like anything. Um, it, it can become like a job. It can become tedious and, and stale if you allow it to. So I feel like you have to remind yourself like not everyone gets to play Alphaba you know, such a few percentage of of women in the world get to play her, such a few percentage of people really get to tap into this side and and relay messages from from our loved ones. So it's when you like circle back to that, and it's just, it's a, it's a very humbling grounding experience. So yeah. Can I ask you a question? Sure. (laughs) How does being a medium help you personally? Because I would think like, God, if I, gosh, if I was a medium, I'd be able to know all these things and like, have like a sense of like relief for like, is, does it work on you? Like, does it help you as a human? Like, is, I don't know. (laughs) Yes. And no, (laughs) it helps me in the big picture, but uh, um, you bring up a great question, which I'm thank you for asking because um, if, if everyone's watching at home for the, this is our first episode, this is one of the most commonly asked questions or misconceptions about mediums is that we'll know things for ourselves. We don't. Um, it, it's a real rarity. Once in a while in a meditation, I can pick up on a family member of mine who, who has passed. And um, whenever I get her, I'm like, all right, what do you got for me? Because I know if she's coming through, she wants to relay something. Most of the time, I don't get anything for myself or for my spouse or for my family, because the reason is the temptation would be there to then, if we could do that all the time, we would then have a roadmap of how to do everything and have like this crystal clear you know, um, picture perfect life where I think the real adventure comes into play when obviously a medium's always going to acknowledge free will. So the real fun and the real journey begins when, when, when we start to choose and we can't go, Hey, what would you do on this? What would you do on this? Um, right. what about this, my bigger picture, my outlook on life though, is, is so, is so different being a medium. I think, um, there's, you know, there's certain things I always remind myself of, you know, um, situations are only temporary. You know, when we get into yucky situations, they're only temporary. Um, we have the choice to, to change a yucky situation is usually what I, how I describe it. And, you know, um, so yeah, I would say that in the immediate here and now, no, I don't get as much, but it changes your outlook. Like when I was in high school and early college, I was, um, I had a lot of anxiety that I was getting in large groups of people. I didn't know where it was coming from. I wasn't anxious about anything in particular, but it's, I would always write down questions that I had for people, but I didn't know where the questions were coming from. Little did I know it was this. I feel like I've had many moments in my life where I've been like, I knew that was going to happen. Like, and it's strange, but like, I, I knew it. 
but I wish I could kind of tap into it more or like understand it more, but it's those, a- it's those wild moments that happen to you. And I feel like it happens to a lot of people. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm wrong. I don't know, but. You're absolutely correct though. And certain things, depending if they're really big events, Ooh, this is a whole nother day, but there are certain things that I talk about when I see an X on someone t- someone's timeline, I that I take as my symbol is this is meant to happen. No matter what, it's meant to happen. So when I saw an X on your timeline as a mom, to me that no matter how you got there, you were going to be a mom. You know what I mean? Um, so when, but how we get there is the adventure. So sometimes when I, if a client has a question for me and I see an X, but then a fork in the road, it means don't worry, you still get to this point. You still get to what you want here. It's just gonna be how you choose. You're gonna get there a different way, but you'll get there. Um, so no, when we have a feeling that something big is coming, I often say, mm, this part feels like we mapped this out before we got here. And now you're just sensing that it's coming um, is, is, is what I can say. Because sometimes they like to give us a little bit of a warning for how to prepare for things. Um, yeah. So many times, gosh, so many times you'll hear people say, I just knew it before so-and-so passed. I had a gut feeling that today was going to be the day that they went home or things like that. Um, yeah. Um, or it could be like, hey, um, I just knew that like the crap was going to hit the fan today and it did. Or and it could be something minor. I just knew today was going to be a stressful day. Performer that you've met backstage that left you a little starstruck. Adina Menzel. Oh, you did you perform for her? I didn't perform for well, maybe I kind of did. I'm I I don't know if she actually like saw the any part of the performance, but I believe it was the it was when I it was when I was playing Alphaba on Broadway. And I, the way that you come off stage right after the bows and she was standing there. <laughs> I was in Alphaba. I had no clue she was gonna be there. <laughs> and I literally like stopped breathing for a few moments because I've always been such a big fan of hers. Um, you know, since rent, obviously. Uh, so yeah, I was definitely like taken aback when I met her. I probably sounded like an idiot when I was talking to her too, <laughs> because I was probably stuttering and like not saying anything. At all. That's, uh, that's, that's crazy. Yeah. That would have thrown me <laughs> too. I would have been like, um, what are you doing here? <laughs> yeah. Like, oh, you're here. Did, did you just watch? <laughs> did you, did you like? <laughs> I, oh, I don't know. <laughs> if you were, so while I don't believe in this, if you were had to be stuck in the theater as a ghost for all of eternity and could only watch one show for the rest of eternity on Broadway, what would you pick? Oh gosh. Um, a really good version of Gypsy. If it that's, wasn't Wicked, it would be a really Haley good version. Of, Haley said Gypsy. Well, Haley and I, we are like manifesting that someday we Did could be imagine? in Gypsy together. Like it is like, because I grew up as a major Natalie Wood fan. Like since I was a child, I was, I have this like very strange connection with her. Um, and I don't know what it is. Like I was reading her biography when I was on tour with Mama Mia and Robert Wagner walked by me as I'm reading her biography. And I was like, oh gosh. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, ever since I saw her in Gypsy, I've been like wanting to play that role so badly. I love that show. You'd be, oh my God, you'd be so good. So good. Um, what is, oh, what character that you played at any point in your life do you think would benefit most from a medium? I haven't played many characters in my life besides, I think it would probably be, I covered her for a hot minute, Nessa Rose. <laughs> Interesting. You'd pick her over Alphaba. Hmm. Yeah, because I... I think like you said, Elphaba is really in touch, you know, even though she, there's a lot of things she doesn't understand yet. Like she's very in touch and like open and she has a willingness to be open to, you know, hearing a moan happen through (laughs) through the wind and running and going after her sister. Um, But like she, (laughs) Nessa, I feel like people that are super, and I'm, 
I'm not saying this in any way to like put anybody like down, but I feel like people that are super kind of closed off or more like they have a very specific view or like only one way of doing something would really benefit from a medium because it really does. It truly opens up your perspective of even if you don't believe, like believe in it, like you have to say, gosh, there's possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. Like I, I'm open, like I'm a full circle. Like I, I love, I love like what you do. I'm so fascinated by it. And I had an incredible time having my reading with you. And I, and I always have had that, like even watching other mediums practice, like on you know television shows or it's just, it's fascinating to me, but I feel like the, the more, the person that's more closed off could benefit from it. If you were to tap into your psychic tendencies, your gut, what do you think the future of Broadway looks like after this pandemic is over? I think that it's going to look very different in that more people are going to have voices that are heard um, in the best way possible. Yes. Uh, I don't think we'll be back for some time sadly, but I do think that when that day comes, it's going to be one of the most glorious days that live theater. I like, I get like overwhelmed when thinking about it, but I do think that it's going to still be the same in the sense that it's going to bring the same joys and it's going to allow people that go to see theater to escape for a couple hours, just like they did before. Um, and I think we're going to have, we have a lot of material to work with and to pull from after this very insane time. And there's going to be a lot of Broadway performers that will be so grateful for their positions. Not, not that everybody isn't always, but you know, when you do something eight times a week, you know, uh, for a very long period of time, and that is pulled out from under you, you kind of can realize how lucky you were to be there in the first place. So I, I think I think it's going to be a very positive change. I agree. One of the things that I pull up sometimes when I do readings for from the Broadway performers is Broadway also feels safer to me coming up. So for example, like they showed me theaters that were are going to be refurbished. And they're like, as long as we have to spend the money, we might as well. I see like metal detectors coming up. I see more things where it's so. safer. We we need it to be a safer experience for everyone. Um, and it's funny, I was thinking about it. It's hard to not get emotional thinking about that one of the final lines of Wicked coming back from the pandemic. I was thinking about it. And if you think about Glinda's line, you know, she says, you know, we've been through a frightening time and mm -hmm. you know, there'll be other times and other things that frighten us. But if you let me, I'd like to try to help. And I, I can only imagine I have goosebumps hearing it, you know. Like, me too. You just it said would, it. I have goosebumps. What it would be like being in that theater to hear that moment, like, you know, for the first time when Broadway comes back and. I told, I told your man, I told Mary Beth Abel, I said, I will be there to cheer you guys on that day when you guys are back and um, it's going to be special. So it is, well, you know, like, like life in general, like that line has had different meanings over the 14 years that I've been in the show, whether it was a personal thing for me that I've overcome or something that was going on in our world that was super just unknown and, and crazy and and each each thing keeps getting kind of bigger and having more weight to it and this situation and and not just pandemic but all of the other movements and the thing the important changes that need to happen in our world right now um I mean, there's so many different <laughs> layers to it. <laughs> well, Jenny, I want to thank you for for being our guest here today. Um, oh, thank you for having me. I'm so, so excited. <laughs> and um, please keep an eye out if um, at home. Go follow her, look her up, look at all the incredible things that she has done. And I can't wait for you guys to be able to go support her at a new show, whatever show, wherever she goes in the future. It's it's going to be great if it has Jenny Denoya in it. So Aww. thank you again so much. And I will talk to you soon. Thank you so much, Jimmy. I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.